chapter one of the submarine boys and the smugglers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by john brandon the submarine boys and the smugglers by victor g durham chapter one assigned to strange sea duty old jerry civil war boatswain and naval veteran had been dead for six weeks thomas crumb the new messenger a man of about thirty years of age did not know the very young man who presented himself for attention in the corridor leading to the outer offices of the secretary of the navy my man kindly informed the chief clerk to the secretary that mr benson is here awaiting his pleasure and that of the secretary said the newcomer a neatly dressed very erect and athletic-looking young man of eighteen or possibly just past that mark in age do you think the secretary will see you today? grinned crum i'm sure i don't know replied jack benson i'm hardly thinking he will my laddie buck chuckled the messenger no familiarity if you please rejoined the caller coolly and with no sign of displeasure in his face are you going to take my name in at once some apprentice seaman maybe thought crumb shrewdly looking the youth over in detail you can't tell these apprentice seamen from gentlemen when they get on land with their shore money in their pockets are you going to take my name in benson insisted maybe ye have a card about you suggested the messenger grinning more broadly oh is that what you're waiting for inquired jack unruffled i believe you're right about that my man from an inner pocket benson drew forth a morocco card case the corners of which were ornamented with silver from the case he drew forth an engraved visiting card which he tendered that messenger crumb glanced at it all he saw was john benson u s n and this might mean after all that the caller was merely an apprentice or at most a petty officer but the card was the kind carried by commissioned officers in the united states navy maybe you're a midshipman from annapolis suggested crumb glancing up from the card i might be true nodded jack as a matter of fact i am an acting lieutenant junior grade all the banter fled at once from the messenger's face and tone he straightened up making an awkward attempt at a salute i beg your pardon sir but you looked so young murmured the messenger apologetically it will take some years to outgrow that defect benson replied with a slight smile but what are you going to do with that card my man pardon me sir i'm taking it in at once replied the messenger with another clumsy salute he vanished through the nearest door jack did not take one of the chairs for he hardly expected to be kept waiting long it was a beautiful spring morning but spring in washington is as warm as summer in many other places so benson had worn a straw hat with his neat gray sack suit his russet shoes were immaculate in their gloss from top to toe young benson's attire was faultless within a space of ninety seconds the messenger returned walking briskly the chief clerk desires you to report to him at once sir said crumb respectfully shall i take you in sir i'm capable of moving under my own steam thank you messenger jack laughed the messenger held the door open for him closing it after the young lieutenant had passed through good morning sir was jack's greeting as he stepped up to mr packard's desk ah good morning mr benson replied the chief clerk rising and offering his hand i'll see if the secretary is disengaged will you be seated benson however remained on his feet while the chief clerk hastened through another door he was back almost at once the secretary is disengaged 
and we'll see you now mr benson thank you sir as benson entered the inner office he saw the great man of the navy bent over his desk signing paper after paper so the young officer did not advance but stood by the door hat in hand without making a sound at last the secretary looked up ah good morning mr benson good morning sir as the secretary arose extending his hand to the submarine boy benson stepped briskly forward have a seat mr benson continued mr sanders the secretary jack appropriated the chair pointed out to him he sat very erect looking straight into the secretary's face let me see where are you at present inquired the secretary briefly the temptation came to benson to reply that he believed he was in the united states navy department at washington the secretary however was not one to be treated with levity so the young officer answered mr hastings mr somers and myself have been stationed at the norfolk navy yard sir for the last month where we have been awaiting orders from there we came to washington to-day sir and are stopping at the arlington you've been on waiting orders repeated the secretary who was too important an official to be expected to know the whereabouts and performances of all the officers in the navy let me see rummaging among some papers mr sanders finally drew forth a sheet and glanced at it we have not been doing much with our submarine boats of late mr benson let me see your last craft was the sudbury sir jack informed him quite right nodded the secretary that boat is now laid up in reserve i have decided to order yourself and your two associates to the grant have you ever seen the craft no sir but she's a farnham pollard boat i believe and in that case i shall expect to feel at home aboard of her at once the grant is let me see consulting another paper the secretary continued the grant is now on her way to norfolk in tow after having been tested she should arrive at norfolk this afternoon or some time during tonight yes sir she was expected when we left very well mr benson that is your billet you will command the grant until further orders your orders and those for mr hastings and mr somers will be signed and turned over to you before you leave very well sir are there any especial instructions for me in connection with the new command very important special instructions mr benson in fact you are to employ the grant on a business that is not connected with naval service a gleam of unusual interest shot into the boy's eyes he did not however speak but waited for the secretary to do so at the request of another member of the cabinet and by command of the president continued mr sanders you are now to convert the grant without informing any one of the fact into a revenue cutter jack benson's face must have dropped more than he was aware for the secretary laughed lightly you do not fancy that kind of appointment mr benson i'm wholly at your orders sir but you don't like the appointment it isn't my place sir to like or dislike any order that comes to me from the proper source sir you don't like the idea mr benson the secretary of the navy continued yet if i am any judge whatever of your make-up and temperament you will soon like this new work better than any assignment i could offer you mr benson your work is to be of such a very special nature that you are not to inform any one outside of your two junior officers what the mission of the grant is that begins to look much more interesting already sir jack replied now smiling your published orders will call only for a cruise and practice work with the crew and the trying out of the craft mr sanders went on your actual those secret orders i will give you now jack benson waited gazing straight into the secretary's eyes in other words lieutenant 
said mr sanders we want you to catch a crowd of smugglers we don't know what vessel or vessels are engaged in the work in fact we have no definite information of any kind except that several parcels of valuable goods smuggled have been sent to new york from certain coast towns in new jersey this would point to the fact that the goods come into the united states by way of the new jersey coast in general terms lieutenant your task is to scour as much of the jersey coast as is necessary until you find the smugglers if possible it is a difficult task i admit and that is why i have picked you for it you are one of the most enthusiastic ingenious and tireless young men in the navy and i am certain that you will succeed if any one can as mr sanders paused jack responded quietly thank you sir on this sheet you will find the names of new jersey express offices from which parcels of smuggled goods have been shipped to new york city continued the secretary glance over it now jack made a hasty yet thorough inspection of the list what do you conclude asked the secretary i note that the smuggled items include high-priced silks and satins laces of a kind that are usually made in france and in some instances gems though precious stones do not seem to make up the greater part of the values of the goods i should imagine that the smuggled articles all come from france sir though that may prove to be a hasty conclusion the smuggled articles are believed to come largely from france nodded the secretary but why should the parcels be shipped from so many different points in new jersey why i should suppose sir in order to throw possible suspicion off the track replied benson if all the parcels came from the same office the express agent might grow suspicious and report his suspicions right again nodded the secretary of the navy the first information did in fact come through express company sources these different towns benson continued as he again glanced along the list extend along the length of that portion of new jersey which borders on the atlantic ocean and you will also note continued secretary sanders that the shipments occur on almost every date in the month it looks very much as though more than one vessel were being employed in bringing in the goods or else sir lieutenant jack benson suggested very respectfully the receivers of the smuggled goods have excellent means for taking care of them and so avoid making large shipments a very good answer cried the secretary delightedly mr benson whatever you do not grasp of the situation now i am certain you will grasp once you are on the scene and have put your keen mind at work but what i think you want more particularly of me sir the youth ventured with a smile is to grasp the smugglers themselves that you do not want to pay any attention to the people in new york who receive these smuggled goods is quite apparent from the fact that you already have here the names and addresses of the parties in new york to whom the express parcels have been delivered may i ask a question sir yes mr benson has any move been made yet against these new york parties who are the final receivers of the smuggled goods no action has been taken so far replied secretary sanders you see mr benson that news would travel swiftly and would put the real smugglers on their guard at once now what the government wishes to do is to catch the parties who are doing the actual smuggling if we catch only the final receivers of the goods the real smugglers will be troubled only to find new customers i quite understand that sir then what you make of the riddle mr benson first of all sir i would like to know something as to my general instructions if you catch the smuggling craft and catch it red-handed then you will seize that craft at once and treat it as a prize informing this department at once of your success 
but lieutenant benson you must not make any premature moves you must not seize a craft suspected of smuggling you must have proof positive then i am not to search any craft on suspicion jack asked quickly obviously not replied the secretary for then the real object of your presence along the coast of new jersey would be known far and wide in shipping circles no this is a matter lieutenant in which you must proceed with the utmost caution if you fail in using discretion then your blunders will reflect on the navy department it would be easy enough to put a revenue cutter on the job but a revenue cutter we are convinced would not serve for the detection of such clever rascals as the government believes those to be with whom we contend before i leave washington benson suggested i must go to the proper department and get a list of all coastwise vessels that are likely to touch at the new jersey coast yes such a list may be of great help now here are some further instructions that will perhaps make the matter clearer continued mr sanders handing over a bulky document take this over by that window and read it through while i am attending to some routine matters here on my desk for twenty minutes jack benson was thus engaged the further he read into this document of instruction the more he began to like the idea of his new assignment to duty Phew, i shall find that i have a clever lot of rascals to battle against murmured the youth the government already knows much about this smuggling enterprise and yet is forced to admit that it doesn't know enough to place a heavy hand on the real smugglers the more i look this over the more i find it to my liking do you comprehend your task lieutenant benson queried secretary sanders turning around at last i think i do sir as much as i am likely to until i arrive on the actual scene benson answered can you catch the smugglers i don't like to admit sir that there is anything in the line of duty which i can't do lieutenant jack answered setting his jaws squarely a very good answer mr benson you tend to confirm the hope that i have of you in this matter i shall succeed sir promised the submarine boy if there is any possible way in which i can land success unless you have some further questions to ask me remarked the secretary you now have your full orders in the matter very good sir replied the young officer reaching for his hat i will procure the list of coastwise trading vessels then unless you direct me otherwise sir i will go to the arlington to lunch with my brother officers and then take an early afternoon train for norfolk do so nodded the secretary a telegram from this department will instruct the commandant of the yard at norfolk to turn over to you the grant and to furnish you with such draft of men as you will need for the craft you will put to sea as soon as ready and from that moment you will act on your own discretion of course reporting to this department frequently very good sir i wish you success mr benson said the secretary of the navy once more extending his right hand once outside of the state war and navy building jack benson decided on using a cab not for the purpose of avoiding fatigue but as a means of making quick time forty minutes later lieutenant jack his list of coastwise vessels among his other papers strode into the lobby of the hotel arlington ahoy there mate called the cheerful voice acting ensign somers he of the bright red hair and nearly perpetual grin rushed forward to meet him while acting ensign hal hastings came forward at a slower and more dignified pace got our orders eph inquired eagerly yes jack nodded what are they mr somers responded jack putting on an immense amount of dignity for the moment the pleasure of your superior officers will be communicated to you when the moment of need arrives oh lollipop gasped the irrepressible f straightening up stiffly and executing a very formal salute very good sir which is to say smiled lieutenant jack as hal joined in 
that we are ordered to a tryout and practice cruise on the grant how soon do we report immediately i had hoped it would be sooner than that retorted f with mock gravity i'm in a hurry to get away from washington this is the third time i have been at the national capital and i haven't yet found time to do half a day of sightseeing where do we take the grant asked hal we board her at norfolk and proceed north along the coast possibly as far as new england jack answered in low tones for many strangers were passing them every minute in the lobby now let's have luncheon at once our train leaves in an hour from now then i shall have my wish cried f with more mock fervor i had hoped to escape from washington ere some sociable idiot tried to take me around and show me something of the city if you want to see washington jack retorted you have several periods of leave during the year you can use up one of those furloughs in seeing washington the lobby being a long one the three young acting naval officers had some distance to walk in order to reach the dining room on their way they had occasion to pass three rather overdressed young men of twenty years or so whose general appearance suggested that they were members of the theatrical profession as jack hal and f passed with that combination of erect carriage and easy walk that one learns on the quarter-deck they were surveyed rather curiously by the other trio who's the dude kid with the sunburst hair inquired one of the strangers of his friends there was a low laugh from the others f who had heard and who instantly realized that his own red hair had been alluded to flushed in a way that made his cheeks match his hair did you see that sunrise cal continued the unknown tormentor until the insults were made more personal and pointed f resolved not to pay heed though the word sunrise referred to his all too plain flushing of the face my but he's a shining youth went on the tormentor jeeringly shines from head to foot look at those glossy tan shoes they make my eyes ache really i must do something to them don't get too frisky wally advised the stranger who had been addressed as cal of course i won't promised wally all i want to do is take some of the edge off the shiny shoes sauntering along at a swifter pace than f summers was using the youth designated as wally ranged alongside then with pretended awkwardness stepped squarely on the toe of f's right shoe as wally withdrew his foot he succeeded in his efforts to ruin the polish that was too much smack f summer's right fist shot straight out landing on the stranger's face wally went down with a good deal of haste and sat on the hard floor of the lobby looking a trifle dazed the next time you remark anyone with sunburst hair hinted f his face now relaxing into a grin just bear in mind mr fresh that sunburst hair often carries a sunstroke temper with it you're it saying which f turned as though to pass on into the dining-room he was halted however by wally who sprang to his feet you wait till i hit you glared wally it won't take you long will it asked f curiously jack and hal smiling had halted standing on one side wally's companions rushed up but f did not take the trouble to turn to look at them you young bully roared wally clenching his fist and waving it before the face of f summers who did not seem greatly disturbed thereby how dare you hit me i'm afraid i haven't time to go into that f drawled if you don't know why i hit you then i have no time to discuss the matter with you i'm on the track of a quick lunch just at present will you oblige me either by punching me as you promised or else stepping out of my way 
by this time fully forty people had crowded about one of the hotel clerks and three porters edged through the throng are you here again demanded the clerk eyeing wally who now looked uncomfortable you were chased out of here yesterday and told not to come back we don't want you and your friends hanging around here this hotel is conducted for the comfort of its guests and their friends we're waiting to see mr dravens explained wally naming a well-known theatrical man mr dravens doesn't want to see you and sent polite word to that effect when you called yesterday the clerk went on now i shall have to ask you to leave you and your friends start but this young bully hit me complained wally and he must apologize before i'll leave the clerk who had already recognized lieutenant benson and his friends made haste to reply if this young man hit you he did wally asserted with a choke in his voice then he certainly had excellent reasons the clerk replied now oblige us by leaving this hotel not until insisted wally at a nod from the clerk one of the strong-armed porters seized the youth steering him rapidly to one of the entrances wally's two companions did not lose any time but hurried unaided for another exit too bad murmured f i think that young man really had something on his mind that he wanted to deliver to me don't you believe it jack laughed quietly he wouldn't have struck you without a certain guarantee that you wouldn't do anything to him in return did i lose my temper asked f anxiously yes but not until you were justified in losing it benson answered now let us get at a table before someone else comes along and discovers that it's a sunny day queer how people notice red hair murmured f when they never paid the least attention to brown hair like yours it isn't all in your hair f teased hal in an undertone there's something about your face that makes people want to laugh is that really so somers demanded hal i owe you one for that and i shall take mighty good care to pay my bill at the earliest possible opportunity stop your quarrelling ordered jack and make up your minds what you're going to say to the waiter though he dared not enter the hotel again mr wally was standing on the curbing just below the hotel when the three young naval officers came out to board a car for the railway station there's my man now muttered wally vindictively he was obliged to talk to himself as his two companions had deserted him wally if lacking courage in some respects was not in the least shy of that quality sometimes known as nerve stepping up to somers he demanded have you a card i never play cards f answered were cards what caused your downfall you know what i mean insisted wally if i do f replied coolly i shall keep it to myself it's an old habit with me to keep to myself whatever i know have you a personal card with your address on it wally insisted as the three submarine boys passed on with the stranger keeping doggedly by f summer's side why i want your card wally declared why do you want it summers demanded suspiciously i want to know where to find you again wally retorted sharply that's the most excellent reason i can think of for refusing your request summers responded as far as i'm concerned i shall feel better pleased if i never lay eyes on you again you may well say that jeered the young stranger at this moment the three young officers hailed and boarded a car wally followed them as far as the car steps and was in the act of entering the car when he remembered that he had no nickel to hand to the conductor for three blocks wally followed on foot running along on the sidewalk then puffing he halted a stitch in his side hang it he groaned i wish i knew where to find young carrot top i'd like to pass some trouble on to him 
he was the means of having me put out of the arlington for good and all and now i don't see how i'm ever going to reach the ear of dravens five minutes with dravens and i could have persuaded him to give me a chance in his dutch pagoda company but for carrot top i'd have seen dravens and got that chance regardless of the passers-by mr wally shook his fist vehemently in the direction of the now far distant streetcar like many others of weak intellect wally believed that f s conduct had deprived him of a great chance on the stage so he hated the unknown summers with an intensity peculiar to such dispositions just at that moment the young would-be actor would have felt vastly better if he had known that he and f summers were destined to meet again in the meantime wally's hatred was not likely to die out end of chapter one recording by john brandon chapter two of the submarine boys and the smugglers by victor g durham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john brandon jack meets skipper redbeard i never saw anything as slow as this game murmured f disconsolately here we've put in a month already along the coast of the mosquito state and we might as well have stayed at norfolk for all we've learned it's a baffling hunt lieutenant jack admitted with a sigh i hope the navy department understands just how hard we are up against it every day i'm afraid of receiving a telegram ordering us to take the grant back to norfolk tie her up and go on the waiting orders list it wouldn't be so tough put in ensign hal if it weren't for the fact that the smuggling is still going right on uncle sam must stand to lose a lot of money suggested eph if the parcels of smuggled goods are still being shipped to new york without having paid duty yet your dispatches jack state that these parcels are being regularly shipped uncle sam won't lose much in that direction lieutenant benson answered the people who receive these packages and parcels are all of them sleeping over dynamite mines as soon as the government gets ready to act it will swoop down pounce upon these new york people who are receiving smuggled goods and find them all heavily besides probably sending the offenders to prison the people who are being hurt are we three and myself still more particularly as i happen to be in command secretary sanders picked us out from the whole navy as the three young men who ought to catch the smugglers we aren't making good either if we're recalled we'll be set down as stupid boys and that may be about the last that the navy ever hears about us hang it why can't we have the brains to strike at least a good clue the three young officers had been sitting over their luncheon in the cramped little wardroom of the grant it was hardly larger than a stateroom this tiny little wardroom but as there were three officers required on board this little craft had to have a wardroom in naval terms a wardroom is at once the dining room club room and drawing room of a naval craft from it led a narrow passage with doors opening into two staterooms on either side the fourth was for a medical officer when such happened to be on board on this cruise there was no surgeon nor was it quite correct to speak of doors for the doors had been removed from each of the staterooms and in their place hung woolen portiers this was to save space in the cramped quarters for officers which were aft and of course on a submarine below deck the single waiter on the grant had already been dismissed and the outer door 
of the passageway bolted so the officers felt that they might talk without danger of being overheard at present the grant lay at anchor in the tiny sand enclosed bay of boxhaven an inferior summer resort well south of atlantic city during nearly all of the month the grant had been off one point or another of the coast of new jersey the public and even the crew believed that the main object of the cruise was drill and practice every day the crew was well worked to keep up this delusion as many visitors as permitted had come on board newspaper men and their photographers had paid many calls and had written or photographed as much on and concerning the grant as the regulations allowed for the grant was the biggest the newest submarine torpedo boat in the american navy and in her class the pride of the navy and of the people lieutenant jack had not been loafing neither had his two ensigns on shore secret service men had endeavored to run down the men who had brought parcels of smuggled goods to express offices but so far without result it's a bit stifling down here said lieutenant jack benson rising at last let's go up on deck they rose passing out into the main cabin where at night the gunner's mate and twelve seamen hung their hammocks as they passed through this cabin the enlisted men gathered their rows and stood at attention until jack commanded carry on up the circular staircase and out through the conning tower stepped the three young officers on the tower platform aft of the tower itself a tiny awning had been spread under the awning there was just room for three chairs for the officers there's a boat pulling off from shore and heading this way murmured f somers maybe the fellow bears a telegram ordering our return to norfolk let's not jest about a crusher that is much too likely to happen begged benson fellows we're feeling the disagreeable side of responsibility more than we ever did before for a carefree life with little besides hard work put in hell commend me to that he's not indicated a small lobster schooner that was even then heading into the bay not far away these men who go out during the evening seldom return before early afternoon yes those chaps are lucky in a way jack admitted the lobster man has a rough hard-working life but he has little more to contend with than work and some danger he doesn't know what it is to have the navy department send him on a hopeless errand and then jerk him up for not having performed the impossible if the secret service men who are at work could only obtain a thread of a clue to start us on perhaps we might do the rest within a very short time it was plain that the small boat was actually heading for the submarine at anchor lieutenant john benson on board asked the man at the oars i am he jack answered telegram for you sir as the boat came alongside benson stepped forward received the sealed envelope and signed the oarsman's book then the young lieutenant went back to his seat it's from the department he announced after a glance at the bottom of the message recalling us asked f dryly i don't know it's in the ordinary cipher i shall have to go below and figure it out while he was below hal and f exchanged barely a dozen words what do you think asked jack his eyes blazing as he came up twenty minutes later and dropped once more into his chair recalled to norfolk there to wait orders i suppose hal drawled nothing like it benson answered the department informs me that three days ago four parcels of smuggled goods were shipped from the boxhaven express office right under our noses hal exclaimed 
there is no kick from the secretary jack continued evidently he thinks the information in itself is kick enough and he comes mighty close to being right quivered f what in the name of wisdom ails us fellows how are the smugglers managing to fool us right under our noses there is no certainty that the smuggled goods were landed at boxhaven jack benson maintained quietly yet i believe that the secretary thinks we're lying at anchor in the very harbor of the smugglers what's to be done demanded hal hastings after a long pause i don't know jack confessed frankly but i know what i need a long walk down a quiet road and i'm going ashore to have it want any company hal inquired rising with alacrity no we want to keep at least two officers on board if i can't think out anything for myself i'll let you two draw lots to see who shall be the next to go ashore gunner's mate in answer to the last summons the gunner's mate appeared saluting mate have the gig alongside at once very good sir jack benson went promptly below the gig lay alongside when he came on deck again the young commander of the grant was now in summer gray soft flannel shirt flowing tie tan shoes and the same straw hat he had worn in washington in the gig sat the coxswain and four oarsmen to the usual landing jack ordered as he stepped into the gig and the coxswain after saluting gave the order to the men to give way shall we wait for you sir asked the coxswain touching his cap after jack benson had stepped upon the low pier no i will signal when i wish the gig to take me on board as jack benson turned away disappointment showed on the faces of five jackies they had hoped for a little shore leave which was a scarce article on the grant avoiding the streets of the village benson found a country road that ran to the south three hours of that early summer afternoon he had spent trudging along the lonely country roads when he again neared boxhaven the young naval officer was obliged to admit with a nearly discouraged sigh that he appeared to be as far as ever from having any plan of action in mind i hate to go back again aboard the boat and tell hal and f that i've wasted so much time in shoe leather jack grumbled to himself as he made for the pier not until he had stepped out upon the pier did he realize how absorbed he had been in other matters for he was not on the right pier at all but on one that lay a quarter of a mile south of the usual landing the pier on which he now found himself was older smaller shorter alongside at the end lay a small schooner of perhaps fifteen tons burden looking for anybody called a young man on the pier not far from the schooner he looked like a seafaring man i'm strolling about out of curiosity jack replied pleasantly huh? was the greeting of the other is this craft a lobster man benson inquired as he went nearer the little schooner not exactly replied the sailor what do you mean by that we do more in fishing than in lobster catching replied the young stranger who did not grow more gracious upon further acquaintance it's pretty hard work on the boats along this coast isn't it benson asked pleasantly as he halted gazing aboard the little schooner sometimes it is half grunted the other is the pay good jack went on it keeps us alive said the stranger rather sulkily now what i can't understand jack went on smilingly is why so many of you young strong husky fearless sea-trained young fellows go on working year in year out until you're old men on these fishing craft why don't you go into the navy where there is fine pay and every chance in the world for young fellows with the right stuff in them ha huh, growled the stranger i reckon you don't know much about the navy do you jack challenged pleasantly 
know all I want her about it, grunted the young seafarer. Well, what have you against the Navy? pressed Lieutenant Jack, who was never so contentedly employed as when trying to convince young Americans that they ought to enlist. I've got everything against it, retorted the ungracious stranger. But what, in particular, insisted Benson? The officers, for one thing, came the sullen answer. What's wrong with the officers? Lieutenant Jack inquired. Why, they're the most all-fired, stuck-up lot of dudes you ever saw, replied the sulky one, with a scowl. They just strut about and give orders, and the poor sailors have to go to touching their caps and scraping their feet and acting like so many jumping jacks. Else they get in the brig. An officer gets down on some sailor who doesn't throw quite enough soft soap or palaver, and that sailor might as well be dead. That officer just spends his spare time after that lying about the poor Jackie and getting him into trouble. I guess you've never seen anything of the real life of the Navy, retorted Jack Benson, sternness creeping into his voice. If you've heard anything at all about the Navy, you've heard it from some deserter. Now a sailor who'll break his oath and desert is hardly to be believed on any point whatever. Huh? If you had followed the sea more and had met as many jackies as I have, retorted the young man, you'd have a different idea about the Navy. I know the pay is good enough, but I make more money anyway than the fellows in the Navy do, so I'm not interested in signing on in the Navy. But you seem to have a very queer idea of the officers, Jack pursued. They're a mean and stuck-up lot, the seafarer retorted with some heat. They're almost as bad as the revenue officers. So you don't like the officers in the revenue cutter service either? Jack inquired. I hate them, flared the other. What did the officers in the revenue cutter service ever do to you? Asked Jack Benson, looking straight in the other's face. Nothing, but I hate them just the same, retorted the young seafarer. A brisk step sounded behind them. Want anything on this pier, young man? hailed a heavy, hoarse, brusque voice. Jack turned leisurely to survey the speaker, who proved to be a heavily built man of medium height with tousled, tow-colored hair, a somewhat reddish beard, and a still redder face. His apparel was very ordinary, but the visored blue cap on his head completed the idea that he was a follower of the sea. Jack's mind at once placed the man, who was about forty years old, as the skipper of the schooner. As Jack Benson continued to stare at him, the red-faced man began to look angry. "'I asked you, young man,' he bellowed, "'if you want anything out on this pier.' "'I strolled along,' Jack replied politely, "'took a look at your schooner.' if it is your craft, and had a bit of a talk with this young man. And then, if that was all your business here, you're through, aren't you? demanded the red-bearded man. I'm through, Jack conceded. If you own this pier and don't want me here, maybe your room would be just as good as your company, retorted the red-faced one. If you really want me to go, then, of course I'll go, Jack agreed, but... I didn't know that you felt any need of secrecy here. At mention of the word secrecy, there came a change in the face of the red-bearded man. It was a fleeting change, gone in an instant. Don't get fresh around places where you've no business, young man, he retorted. Turning, he stepped aboard the schooner. Come on and tend to your business, Jake, he called to the young seafarer, in a tone that proclaimed him master of the schooner. Into Jack Benson's mind had come a sudden determination to seem a bit stubborn and see what came of it. So he turned his back on the schooner, but still loitered on the pier. A minute later, the red-bearded man stepped heavily over the side of the schooner, coming straight toward Benson. Young man, are you going to get off this pier, or are you not? Why should I? jack asked coolly because i've told you that you ain't wanted here 
do you call that a good reason jack inquired with a smile it's good enough for me bellowed the wrathful skipper but quite possibly not good enough for me jack rejoined why have you taken a notion to be disagreeable to me anyway am i doing you any harm here am i doing anything that interferes with your rights will you get off the pier or shall i grab you by the coat collar and run you off demanded the irate skipper neither jack answered then you won't get off not until i'm ready unless you offer me a good reason why i should go earlier i've got two good reasons and they're right here bawled the skipper raising his heavy fists toward jack now are you going your reasons aren't quite big enough jack laughed quietly they aren't hey demanded the skipper advancing we'll see about that with both hands he made a dive for jack's collar but benson stepped nimbly out of the way as the heavy skipper turned to follow him jack thrust out one of his feet that trip brought the skipper down with such force that his fall jarred the pier timbers i'll pay you back for that roared the skipper getting lumberingly onto his feet while jack smiled provokingly at him this time two sledgehammer fists milled at the boy's head but jack benson was no amateur in boxing sea life had taught him much in this line without giving an inch of ground he parried the ugly blows until he saw his chance to drive in a blow that floored the skipper jake bellowed the skipper as he started to rise to his feet bring a couple of belaying pins and we'll attend to this city dude's case if you're wise jake benson called warningly you'll remain right where you are if i have to defend myself i'll soon begin to get rough and mix things up the two of you won't be enough to whip me and you'll both have broken heads before you're through with me jake who had watched the fight up to date was inclined to agree that this very thing might happen so though he had snatched up a pair of belaying pins he now halted at the schooner's rail coming you jake demanded the skipper hoarsely no he isn't jack benson retorted jake has more sense than you have and he doesn't want to get a broken head in another man's stupid quarrel are you going to get off this pier demanded the skipper not until i'm quite ready benson answered if you had been civil i would have gone at once now i'm going to suit my own convenience and pleasure let me give you a bit of advice my man don't be so quick with your fists for you're almost certain to run up against a better boxer than yourself you don't know the least thing about real fist fighting go on your craft and cool off and presently i'll stroll off the pier as i strolled on to it i'll see you again growled the skipper wrathfully as he turned i'll settle this with you too lieutenant benson smiled but did not answer in words for three or four minutes after the skipper had vanished into the schooner's cabin benson dallied on the pier at last he turned and walked away outwardly benson was cool enough but inwardly he was far from calm gracious he muttered i really believe i've hit upon something that will be well worth watching that young sailor let it out that he disliked the officers of the revenue cutter service and then he was confused when i asked him what he had against the revenue service then his captain as soon as i mentioned the word secrecy looked mighty strange for an instant why may not that schooner be the smuggler as well as any other craft some vessel along the new jersey coast is doing the smuggling and that schooner the velvet which i've seen a dozen times may be the very craft i won't go back to the grant just yet i'll take dinner at one of the hotels eat slowly think fast and maybe ask a few questions around the village this may lead to something really great in the line that we've been hunting 
strolling up the principal waterfront street outwardly wholly placid lieutenant jack benson stopped at the bel air the best summer hotel in the place here meals were served on two side verandas taking out a table jack seated himself to enjoy a shore dinner and his own thoughts while we leave him momentarily thus engaged let us glance briefly at jack benson's previous exploits and those of his two friends in the service hal hastings and f summers all our readers recall the first volume of this series the submarine boys on duty in this was told how jack benson and hal hastings two boys wandering about in search of a living came to the little seaport town where jacob farnham shipbuilder and david pollard inventor were constructing the first of the subsequently famous farnham pollard submarines how jack and hal tried with all their might to secure employment with the builders and how f summers subsequently joined them is well known all their first steps in patiently mastering the details of life and work on a diving torpedo boat are told in this first volume as well as the amazing adventures that befell them in the second volume the submarine boys trial trip we found our three young friends working night and day to become experts in their most unusual calling the details the awful perils and the rousing plot unfolded have not yet escaped the recollection of any of our readers in the submarine boys and the middies we found our young friends so far masters of their work that they were sent to the u s naval academy at annapolis to serve as civilian instructors to the brigade of midshipmen in the mysteries of handling the farnham pollard submarines with the midshipmen jack hal and f had some wonderfully amusing adventures and shared some of the most startling dangers of the deep then in the fourth volume the submarine boys and the spies we found our young friends exposed to the cleverest work of the spies of different foreign governments all of these spies doing their level best to penetrate the mysteries of the farnham pollard submarines jack hal and f in fact more than once came within an ace of losing their lives in their efforts to thwart clever and dangerous spies it was a stirring tale of adventure of the best type as all our readers will remember the submarine boys lightning cruise dealt with incidents even more exciting and attended by very different circumstances the plot unfolded was one to arouse the patriotism of an american boy and to gratify his craving for the most thrilling adventures all through these varied and truly wonderful adventures the three lads by constant application to their work had made themselves more complete masters of their chosen profession in the volume preceding this present one the submarine boys for the flag we found our lads recognized as being in many respects among the best informed authorities on the handling of submarine craft and especially of the farnham pollard type of which the united states now owned many foreign governments now try to secure the services of the submarine boys outright offering them advantageous positions in foreign navies the train of adventures related in this narrative finally placed the three in brief command of a united states naval craft under direct authority from washington such excellent work did they now perform that all three in order to keep them in the united states service were offered positions as acting officers of the navy jack benson's appointment was as acting lieutenant junior grade while hal and f were appointed as acting ensigns all three of the boys being too young to receive actual commissions from the president were promised commissions as each reached the age of twenty-one and now let us return to that keen young follower of the sea lieutenant jack benson whom we shall find finishing his solitary dinner on the porch of the hotel bel-air 
as we approach him again we find him pondering earnestly on the meaning if any of the conduct of the two men at the schooner's pier end of chapter two recording by john brandon chapter three of the submarine boys and the smugglers by victor g durham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john brandon chapter three making a bid for trouble mr benson i believe the hail came so unexpectedly that jack buried deep in thought started slightly as he looked up didn't frighten an old dog like you did i came the laughing question how do you do mr white was jack's greeting as he rose holding out his hand to clasp the one offered him what are you doing round here asked mr white may i sit down with you yes to the last question jack answered as to my business here haven't you heard there's been enough in the newspapers about it never read the newspapers they're a beastly bore replied young white a man of perhaps twenty-five as he dropped into a chair i should think in your position in the state department you'd have to read the newspapers benson went on no for my work the little that i do relates mostly to digging through ancient documents treaties and the like you know ned white was the son of a manufacturer who had amassed several millions of dollars in business ned had positively declined business as a career had been educated as a lawyer grinding work however was not much to young white's taste as the only son of a rich man he couldn't discover that he would ever have much need of industry so the father a man rather useful in party politics and determined to keep his son at some form of employment had secured for ned a clerical appointment to the state department at washington where his legal training would make him of some use ned rented an apartment in washington at a rental just twice the size of his salary from the government the father supplying the needed funds ned was not wild at all but he had a settled aversion to continued hard work and did as little at the state department as he could and escape the censure of those over him at heart barring his laziness he was a good fellow perhaps the main thing that ailed the young man was that he had not yet found congenial outlet for his energies jack had met this budding diplomat in washington though the two had never become more than casually acquainted you're running a submarine again white asked as he scanned the bill of fare benson replied that he had command of the grant which was engaged on a practice and trying out cruise wish i could go with you remarked ned white though i don't suppose you could get leave to take a passenger that's a hard thing to do you know lieutenant jack smiled it isn't at all easy to secure permission to carry a passenger on a naval vessel i believe i could get that fixed at washington if i were sure that you would regard me as being really welcome on board white replied as he signaled a waiter come by all means if you can secure the necessary permission of the navy department jack answered what accommodation have you on board asked white looking up eagerly do i have to sleep on a seat in the cabin no there's a vacant stateroom for the accommodation of a surgeon and we haven't one on this cruise by jove i believe i'll try to get a permit ned white laughed looking interested i've never been on a submarine and i'd like the experience i'm glad i've met you benson jack did not believe white would have much luck with the navy department while it is invariably difficult to secure passage on a craft of the navy secretary sanders was certain to be even more than unusually slow to grant permission considering the nature of the real mission on which the young officers of the grant 
were engaged ned white ordered a heavy dinner but he ate it quickly while doing so he explained that he had utilized the first part of his vacation to come down and look over the bel air which property his mother had recently given him the landlord has been a bit slow about paying the lease money you know white added in a low tone it's because the season is yet young he tells me during the last few minutes the sky had been clouding and now rain and wind came together bright lightning and heavy thunder followed driving the few guests from the verandas come up to my rooms benson invited the idle young man we can chat there and be dry at the same time i want to pump you a bit about the attractions of the submarine life though he would rather just then have been rid of his companion ned white was so thoroughly good-humoured and likable that jack did not see his way to refuse the invitation a poor old hotel this muttered white as he opened the door to his rooms yet i fancy i have rather the best quarters here see how dismal it is really i'm a bit ashamed to own such a hotel when shame weighs you down too hard laughed lieutenant jack just deed the property over to me why it wouldn't net you much drawled young white only forty five hundred dollars a season that's considerably more than i'm making now smiled benson as he took a seat oh of course the government pays beastly salaries said white with his easy lordly air but then of course you have some outside income of your own all fellows in the government service have i have nothing that i haven't earned myself jack answered just then the wind shifted driving in a deluge of rain through one of the open windows ned sprang to close the window for he could display a good deal of energy when he wished you're a sailor ned white went on tell me how long this rain is going to last the way the sky looked and the way it's raining now jack answered it may last for some hours yet then you won't be going out to your craft tonight white rejoined you can put up here there are plenty of vacant rooms and i'll make gray the landlord put you up in a room as my guest without making you any charge oh i shall have to go back by and by jack protested it would never do for a sailor to let himself be held up by a little rain benson laughed you'll ruin your clothes i have others although trying to preserve an appearance of interest in his companion's remarks benson was thinking actively about the great problem that had been in his mind for a month past at least you'll let me offer you rain clothes asked ned white what sort asked jack looking up with keener interest than his host had expected i'll show you replied white going to a wardrobe he brought forth a long rubber raincoat and a refined imitation of a fisherman's sou'wester headgear i had these the last time i crossed the pond white explained very useful i found them too there's a pair of rubber boots here somewhere the boots too were produced as jack tried on the coat he told himself gleefully the rain and this rig make just what i wanted a real disguise in which i may now approach that wharf again if i keep my face shaded i wouldn't be recognized if seen but i mustn't be seen benson remained a half an hour longer chatting as best he could with his pleasant friendly host then borrowing the rain clothes and donning them jack bade ned white a hasty good-bye now we shall see if there's anything to be seen tonight he told himself as he merged his dark rain clothes into the blackness of the stormy night there's just a chance that i may be on the right track through the discovery i blundered into this afternoon a chance lieutenant jack benson u s n would have thrilled if he had known right then how much of a chance yet had he been able to see in advance all of the immediate future even his stout sailor heart might have quailed 
End of chapter 3 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 4 of The Submarine Boys and the Smugglers by Victor G. Durham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 4 One Way to Soothe a Dog. It was hard to wait that last half hour, muttered Benson, as he halted in the shadow of some trees. Yet it wouldn't do to prowl about the pier while there was too bright lightning one flash might undo a good night's work i guess the lightning has gone by now however it was still raining heavily but the downpour jack counted as his friend as he walked he peered sharply ahead down the dark waterfront road nor did the young submarine officer wholly neglect to keep a watch astern whenever he came to a clump of trees he halted under them taking a still more complete survey of his surroundings i don't believe captain redbeard will be abroad tonight, unless he has real business out in the open young benson reflected during one of these halts under a tree i wonder if he and his helper are now ashore or aboard ashore i hope for i'd really like a little chance to look over the velvet without being observed as he neared the pier in question he now found all in darkness save for the single dim masthead light required by law as lieutenant jack neared the land end of the pier he once more halted looking keenly for any sign of life aboard the velvet no light shone from the cabin the schooner carried no forecastle having instead a tiny galley forward being engaged supposedly in fishing most of her hull space was taken up with hold where tons of fish could be dropped there was no light in the galley either which was where jake would be most likely to be seated if he were astir though it was not yet quite nine in the evening the hour was not too early for tired fishermen to be in their bunks now it makes a heap of difference to me mused the young officer whether the skipper jake and any one else who may belong to the craft is ashore or merely in the good old bunk on board while prowling in this fashion it wouldn't be good taste to arouse a sleeper after waiting peering and listening for some five minutes jack benson decided to go softly down the pier taking further observations from a point nearer the schooner Grrr, sounded in his path so unexpectedly that jack benson leaped back instantly before him having appeared from somewhere out of the darkness of the night stood a most belligerent-looking bulldog it was a capable business-like animal so far as appearance went the beast continued growling in low notes while watchfully eyeing the movements of lieutenant jack now even if this beast wouldn't bite murmured benson to himself as he stood his ground the least that he will do will be to advertise my coming to anyone who may be sleeping on board confound it i never had as just reason for disliking bulldogs as i have at this present moment after eyeing the dog a little longer benson held out a hand coaxingly nice old fellow he ventured soothingly and took a short step forward Grrr dryly replied the nice old fellow bristling and displaying a few more formidable teeth now confusion to you you're going to spring if i take half a step more aren't you murmured jack benson with that he drew back step by step mr bulldog didn't offer to follow but bristled and watched you'll permit me to get away but you won't allow me on the pier muttered jack you're a good honest even if too suspicious dog the young lieutenant continued under his breath 
and i don't in the least like what i'm going to have to do to you eyeing the dog all the time to guard against surprise benson fumbled in his pockets until his fingers clutched at a pocket handkerchief this is an odd weapon to use in whipping a bulldog benson grimaced but i've seen it work before and i believe it will this time too there was nothing novel in the stratagem that lieutenant jack was now about to test it takes grit and steady nerves however if one is to put the trick through successfully folding the handkerchief grasping one end in either hand benson now advanced slowly yet steadily come on and get it muttered the young submarine officer in a low voice Grrr. mr bulldog showed reliable signs of being about to leap at his enemy take that then taunted lieutenant jack thrusting both hands forward regarding the handkerchief as the weapon with which he was being threatened the dog leaped straight for it fastening his teeth over it bump jack threw back his right foot then swung it instantly forward landing it in a strenuous kick over the exposed pit of the brute's stomach at least a dozen feet the bulldog was hurled landing on its back with all its breath gone that's a nasty trick to play even on an ugly dog jack admitted to himself yet it was the only thing to be done in this case after perhaps a full minute the dog got painfully upon its feet it did not whine or moan but crawled toward land a dejected whipped brute with spirit gone at least for the present no more trouble to be expected from you my friend jack benson murmured under his breath you have my fullest apologies poor old fellow even though you don't know what an apology is satisfied that the bulldog was too crushed in spirit to attack him again jack benson stepped with soft tread onto the pier bit by bit he drew nearer to the schooner less than a dozen feet from her stern rail he halted for a final observation captain redbeard if aboard and asleep was the kind of man who might be counted upon to have a mighty snore jack listened for fully a minute but without result i believe the fellows that work aboard here are all ashore in their homes for the night jack muttered so there can't be any risk in slipping aboard cautiously the young naval lieutenant put one foot over the rail and listened again next he drew the other foot after him the hatchway and windows of the cabin were fastened there is no one sleeping aboard then unless he's sleeping in the hold or out on deck the deck is not a likely place cautiously with an eye to landward all the while the submarine boy made his way forward there was no one in the galley which was not even locked but the hatchway over the hold was padlocked into place a new hatch cover mused lieutenant jack kneeling in order to get a better look in the blackness that prevailed this is a good deal better hatch cover than a thrifty skipper would bother to put on an old fishing boat my but it's solidly made now fish isn't a cargo that has to be protected especially from a little salt water that might drain into the hold by the way though this may be a fishing boat it is remarkably free from any odor of fish jack benson i believe your lucky star is shining up there somewhere behind the rain clouds for it looks as though you were at last on the right track after all these weeks so absorbed had the young lieutenant become in studying the hatch cover and in noting the absence of the odor of fish that he did not see two figures move upon the little pier from the land yet presently the submarine boy's sharp ears caught the sound of footsteps 
Benson looked up with a start to see two men within forty feet of the schooner. If that's the skipper, I'm a fool to be caught in this manner, gritted the submarine boy. There was no time to do anything except to throw himself flat on his stomach and crawl rapidly to the starboard side of the cabin. Even here, he would not be hidden in case the two men boarded astern. Then for a few seconds Jack waited in breathless suspense. The two men did not approach in any seeming hurry. It's going to be a black night, Skipper, suggested Jake. All the better for us, came the gruff reply, which made Jack's heart leap with joy. For now he felt all the more certain that he was on the track of the marine evildoers. Whoomp! came a line aboard at the stern. Throw off the bow line, Jake, ordered the skipper. Then jump aboard. It won't take us over two hours to get out there, will it? inquired Jake. Not if the wind holds the way it is. But I'd rather wait an hour out on the water than be five minutes late. You know how fussy a certain party is. These words filled Jack Benson with all the greater hope of being on the right track. As the skipper had halted in front of the cabin, Jack now had to make a lightning choice. Should he try to remain aboard, taking great chances? Or should he slip overboard, joining the Grant as speedily as possible, and then try under cover of the night to give secret chase to this schooner? Of course, if I go on the Grant, Jack breathed quickly to himself, I will have to take considerable chance of being caught in the wake of this craft. If we were once sighted, the smugglers would have all the alarm they need, and we might never catch them in the act. But if I remain on board this little schooner, how much chance have I of managing not to be discovered here? Thus was he tossed between the uncertainties afforded by either course of action. End of chapter 4 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 5 of The Submarine Boys and the Smugglers by Victor G. Durham this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 5 Jack Grows Really Weird. To the risk of his own life, Jack Benson did not give an instant's thought. No officer or enlisted man in the military service of the United States has any right to consider personal risk where his duty is plain. But the submarine boy's present duty was not plain all he knew was that he must catch the smugglers if possible all that remained to be decided was as to which course would be wiser hoist the foresail jake commanded the skipper that'll be sail enough until we get clear of land that order brought benson sharply to his senses so far he had been concerned with deciding upon the better course now with a jolt he realized that the little craft had been cast clear of the pier and must already be drifting if he meant to get ashore he must do it either by diving or jumping fortunately he was spared the choice for the skipper in going astern to the wheel chose to leap upon the cabin and walk aft over the house in the name of pete what have we here growled the skipper stepping down a heavy hand was laid on benson's shoulder Grrrk, came a hearty snore from the quick-witted submarine boy a sleeper on board eh grumbled the skipper giving jack a harder shake then yanking him to his feet here give an account of yourself as yet the skipper had not seen the young naval officer's face for benson had been lying face downward now as he felt himself being dragged to his feet jack used one hand slyly to pull his sou'wester well over his face who are you demanded the skipper holding his catch at arm's length it was plain that he did not see enough of the face to recognize the youth who had vanquished him in daylight oh 
cried jack in a falsetto tone of alarm scared are you grimaced the skipper you'll be more so maybe before you're through with me here keep your hands off of me but benson had made no move to strike instead he used the fingers of both hands nimbly in forming what looked like letters of the deaf and dumb alphabet come don't make motions ordered the skipper talk up Ooh! continued jack in the same voice which he hardly recognized himself his fingers flew faster than ever a deaf mute eh grunted the skipper jake that deckhand started aft but jack who now dreaded discovery of his identity more than anything else gave a sudden wrench which freed him from the skipper's relaxing clutch there didn't seem to be much need of holding the prisoner anyway for the schooner was now forty feet away from the pier oh yelled jack as he made a dive for the port rail of the schooner not a moment did he linger there but went over the rail splash who was it gasped jake halting by the side of the skipper who had stopped at the rail at the spot where benson had gone overboard get a boat hook and don't ask questions yet ordered the skipper jake speedily returned with the implement desired funny muttered the skipper grimly what asked jake that fellow doesn't come up maybe he came up under the hull and dazed himself jake suggested we'll soon find out returned the skipper for we're driftin and the feller's body would soon be in view body repeated jake with a slight shiver i don't care what that feller did to himself returned the skipper gruffly but he has no business to be found drowned near that pier it might look ugly for us jake that's so assented the deckhand for five minutes during which time the schooner drifted more than a hundred feet further off the ebbing tide jake and his commander watched intently but there was no sign of a floating body it's uncanny declared the skipper with a shake of his round head i don't like this kind of a proceeding you like it as well as i do retorted jake what are we going to do land and report this case and miss the night's work demanded the skipper not to any great extent we'll have to let the feller take his own chances go forward and haul in on the sheet jake started but there seemed to be lead in his shoes hurry ordered the skipper sternly if you don't i'll not waiting to hear the finish of the threat jake went forward and hauled in taking the wheel the skipper brought the craft around so the foresail filled steering the skipper at the same time let his gaze rove backward for more than two full minutes no black-clad body however came to the surface jake haul on the main sheet bawled the skipper finally jake came but as he hauled he called back see anything of that feller not a sight it's tough declared jake we'd better not go out tonight, skipper why not you idiot we won't have any luck skipper jake you're a fool haul away on the halyards yet as the schooner made her way out the skipper himself was by no means at his ease because most sailors are superstitious finding that black-clad figure of one who had not even the power of speech and then seeing that strange being leap overboard to his death was a blow even to the stout nerves of the skipper he himself would much have preferred not putting out to sea that night skipper hinted jake when he made all fast you better go a mile up the coast and anchor for tonight jake you make me weary came the answer in a tone of pretended disgust oh all right grumbled the deckhand as he turned to go forward i don't guess i'm any coward and i can take any medicine that i have to but you know skipper what dead men's fingers are said to do to a rudder shut up roared the skipper 
starting none the less and casting an apprehensive glance astern at the water it's all right jake assented sullenly i'll go to davy jones locker with you that's where we'll have breakfast in the morning whack a belaying pin struck the foremast but the skipper had aimed it at jake had the skipper been a man given to keener guessing he might have had a glimmer of an idea as to what had happened to the stranger at this very moment jack benson though decidedly wet was wholly comfortable in mind following his dive he had swum silently under water for a distance that he knew would carry him under the pier it was hard work swimming below the surface hampered with such garments as he wore and when he came up he was out of breath gasping as soon as he felt the air on his face but he was in complete darkness under the pier and resting on one of the cross pieces between the piling enough of the conversation from jake and the skipper came back to cause the submarine boy to chuckle quietly so i'm a dead man and going to be a ghost next am i asked benson of himself jupiter that may be a good thing to remember later on for i'm sure i'm going to see a good bit of that pair as the mainsail filled and the sheets were hauled in the schooner began to fade into the distance now i'll get on shore mighty quickly muttered the submarine boy letting go his hold he swam out from under the pier and made his way up onto dry land along the road he fairly flew until he came to the pier on which he had landed earlier in the afternoon drawing a whistle from his pocket jack blew a shrill signal on it it was answered by a similar whistle from the grant in the black night benson could not make out the figures of jackie's tumbling over the side into the gig but he knew none the less that they were doing it finally jack heard a slight creak of rowlocks next saw the cutter coming shoreward through the darkness then the cutter ran up alongside the pier to the grant coxswain jack ordered dropping into the stern sheets and give way with a will haste is the word none of the sailors discovered that their youthful commander was drenched the rubber coat hid the young lieutenant completely and it was natural in such a rain that it should appear to be wet all the way out to the submarine craft jack benson kept his gaze on the now very dim light at the schooner's foremast head i've come aboard mr hastings was jack's formal greeting as he stepped over the side returning his junior's salute have the gig made fast to the buoy and have everything in readiness for an immediate start very good sir was hal's reply with another exchange of salutes where's mr somers turned in sir let him sleep then we don't need him now hal quickly turned to give the order to make the gig fast to the nearby buoy for no boat may be carried by a submarine on a cruise gunner's mate called jack sharply that petty officer at once reported order the engine room watch on duty very good sir more salutes were exchanged all ready to cast off sir reported hal very good mr hastings make the anchor cable also fast to the buoy then station a man at the wheel do you see that light standing out to sea yes sir that light is to be our chase after we're under way mr hastings station a man at the wheel and give the engine room signal as soon as the anchor cable is made fast very good sir anchor cable made fast to the buoy sir reported the seaman approaching and saluting helmsman rang hal's voice aye aye sir do you see that masthead light two and a half points off starboard bow aye aye sir follow that light at six mile speed aye aye sir down in the engine room a bell clanged the grant moved slowly ahead 
gaining steerage way then in another moment the engine stopped leaving the submarine to drift find out what's wrong mr hastings called jack benson sharply hal darted into the conning tower and next below in less than sixty seconds he was back on deck saluting sir i regret to report that the engine refuses to work what's wrong asked jack with a start i don't know sir i believe it's a small break the engine room watch are all busy trying to locate the trouble take charge there mr hastings and find out as quickly as you can benson directed experiencing a feeling of sudden dismay hal darted below minutes passed as jack benson paced the very limited area of the tower platform turning every few seconds to look at the schooner's masthead light which was growing dimmer and dimmer end of chapter five recording by john brandon chapter six of the submarine boys and the smugglers by victor g durham this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by john brandon chapter six hal takes a hand next finally with a sigh jack dropped into the deck chair on which ensign hal had been sitting before his commander's return some minutes after that hal hastings stepped on deck sir the break is not a serious one he reported then he explained the nature of it adding we shall be able to put in repair parts and have the engine running within half an hour it might as well be within six months jack replied dismally the light that we were going to follow passed out of sight fifteen minutes ago hal cast a swift glance seaward confirming his superior statement what was that light he asked in a whisper anything to do with our work here i think so jack whispered back then i shan't be easy until i know more about that craft i saw her putting out for i noted that she carried only a masthead light then i saw the red and green side lights hung out but i took it to be a lobster man or fishing boat two sailors in rain clothes were standing a little forward my men called jack and they wheeled saluting are you the deck watch jack inquired yes sir answered one of them you may keep your watch in the cabin for mr hastings and i will be on deck for some time turn on the fans below if they're not running let no one up on deck without permission saluting the sailors hurried below it was none too pleasant on deck even though provided with rain clothes drawing their chairs as far as stern as they could the two submarine boys conversed in low tones jack told all that had befallen him on shore now do you think we're on the trail of the smugglers he asked it's hard to say hal replied probably that pair on the schooner are up to some mischief but it may merely be something that would interest the local police alone what are your plans my main plan is to stay up tonight benson responded since i failed to discover where that schooner went and i'm going to find out what she brings back that is if she dumps any cargo here hal added of course i haven't overlooked the fact that the schooner may put in somewhere else along the coast yet it would be hard to find a quieter landing place than this you may as well turn in hal if you're sleepy for i can hold the deck alone i shan't turn in until i see that schooner heading in again i won't turn in unless it's an order hal hastings replied promptly i can sleep any day or night but it isn't every day that we have a clue to watch i'll be glad enough of your company if you can stand it out here in the wet jack benson nodded the rain is going to stop by and by hal answered studying the sky when the stars come out it'll be fine here on deck so i'll stay up as long as you do by midnight hal's prediction of starlight was verified calling to the watch to bring dry chairs the two submarine boys shed their rain clothes and enjoyed themselves yet at last tired nature began to assert herself the young officers frequently found themselves nodding 
at last benson awoke with a start from what was probably a long nap about a mile off on the water he made out a masthead light also the red and green side lights jack sprang to his feet to find ensign hal sleeping soundly running to the conning tower benson returned with a night glass which he turned on the incoming vessel that's the velvet or i'm a dutchman he muttered with another start then he crossed the deck shaking his chum eh hey, muttered hal the schooner's coming in hastings was on his feet in an instant rubbing his eyes then he reached for the marine glass i'm going on shore jack informed his chum in some way i'm going to find out what that schooner carries for freight take me with you hal begged eagerly you may be glad of help take you in uniform jack inquired with a quizzical smile you might as well go in the revenue cutter service uniform i'll show you how quickly i can hustle into sit clothes hal promised hustle then and wake f up long enough to inform him we're going ashore and leave him in command poor f would be furious if he knew we left him here when going ashore to spy on smugglers then don't tell him why we're going ashore but hustle hal was back in change of costume in a wonderfully short time in the meantime jack benson had called the watch and had passed the word for a boat's crew to be called by the time therefore that ensign hal was on deck the boat's crew came tumbling up the gig which was once again astern since the submarine had been anchored once more was brought hastily alongside and the two young officers embarked pull quickly and with as little noise as possible coxswain jack directed as soon as you've landed us return to the grant with all speed douse this light benson added taking down a lantern that had been placed at the stern don't show any light at all if the coxswain wondered why so much speed and secrecy were wanted he knew his place too well to ask any questions within a few minutes from the time of first sighting the masthead light on the incoming craft jack and hal were on shore by this time the schooner was almost on the point of entering the little bay we've got to leg it down the street hal benson whispered to his chum then i hope there are no dogs loose to chase us and sample our legs hastings retorted the little village of boxhaven at this time of the night was as quiet as any spot in a desert all lights were out even at the bel air fortunately no dogs were abroad either as the submarine boys raced down the street so not much time was lost in reaching the velvet's pier of course we can't wait on the pier for them jack whispered there's that shanty up there if it's vacant hal answered pointing to a shed across the road it was a one-story affair perhaps fifteen by twenty-five feet in dimensions it had a tumble-down look but it stood on higher ground almost across the road from the pier we can take a quick look but it may be inhabited jack went on after calculating that the schooner was now within half a mile of her pier as they reached the door jack chuckled for the door held a to let sign now you go around to the right and i to the left benson added we'll see if there's some way to get inside this will make a fine watch box if we can use it a low whistle from hal hastings soon called his chum around to the other side of the shed here's a window that isn't fastened hal whispered in with you then i'll follow both were speedily inside and the window closed they moved forward to the glass door now if the sun would only rise an hour and a half ahead of time sighed benson we'll be able to use our eyes in the darkness the stars helping hal urged whatever cargo may be brought ashore it probably can't all be handled in one load 
if they come ashore with anything jack suggested you slip out the same window by which we entered hal and trail along keeping yourself shady until you find where they stow the stuff then i'll stay right here and watch for anything else that there may be to see by degrees as hal had foretold their eyes became more and more accustomed to the darkness they saw the hazy hulk of the velvet round slowly in at her pier sails a flap and then beheld two men making the bow and stern lines fast things ought to be moving soon if they're going to move hal hastings breathed gleefully here come two men jack answered and i believe they're carrying something they're fairly staggering under their loads hal whispered back each must be carrying a heavy packing case on his back blazes gasped jack an instant later they're coming here that indeed seemed to be the case for now the two burden bearers crossed the road and began to climb the slope toward the shanty in which the submarine boys had so far been hidden duck for your window hal open it softly breathed jack i'll be right behind you jack retreated as he saw the two burden bearers come close to the door but before he slipped away he made out one to be as he had supposed the skipper while the other was jake hal had started the window and was prepared to raise it to the full extent outside a key was heard in the padlock on the door what's wrong the submarine boys heard jake ask the key sticks i'll keep on working it while you put the goods through that window without a catch hurry up ordered the skipper hal let the window down again as he heard jake trudging around the corner now we're finally caught whispered hastings we can't get out without being seen and we can't stay in here without having a fight on our hands we mustn't have either if we can help it returned jack in a sharp whisper see if we can't find some place to hide hal started toward the rear of the shed jack at his heels trip one of hal's feet caught against something on the floor he would have measured his length had not jack bent forward and caught him don't do that again benson whispered and hustle see here whispered back hastings here's a hole in the floor desperately benson bent forward to examine the hole in the darkness for now jake was close to the window it looks like a trap door benson told himself in feverish haste i believe it slides instead of raising he pushed his hand against the edge to test it noiselessly the trap door moved as though on well-oiled bearings down there with you whispered jack rush my boy drop if there isn't a step jack followed just as jake began to raise the unfastened window hal had found a flight of stairs so did jack who as soon as he found his head below the level of the floor quickly pushed the trap door shut bump sounded the packing case as jake dumped it through the window under cover of the noise of jake's entry jack benson struck a match the little flame showed them a cellar well filled with boxes it's the hiding place of the smugglers throbbed hal in his ear it looks like it jack whispered but we've got to hide behind the furthest boxes i'll try to lead the way hold on to my coat-tail and don't stumble or make any noise they had reached the forward end of the cellar by the time that jake having lighted a lantern threw open the trap again and stepped on the stairs jack benson drew his chum in behind a pile of boxes whispering in hastings ear we're all right i think if we're not found here 
but we'll be at a mean disadvantage if the rascals suspect that there's any one hiding here they'll hold all the tricks in their own hands end of chapter six recording by john brandon